Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Enter the Bible podcast, where you can get answers or at least reflections on everything you wanted to know about the Bible but were afraid to ask. I'm Katie Langston. And I'm Catherine Schiffedecker. And we have as our guest uh, today, a returning guest, because uh, she was so brilliant and wise last time, uh, Professor Jennifer <laughs> Keeland, who is Associate Professor of New Testament at Pittsburgh Theological Seminary. Thank you so much again for being with us, uh, or for coming back, Jennifer. Thank you so much for having me. And you both are so gracious and kind. So, Well, uh, we, we're so happy to have you. Uh, we have a question from a listener um, that asks uh, about the Bible. Uh, go figure. Um, they, <laughs> they say, hi, I'm curious how you approach Bible verses that don't uphold justice i.e. Bible verses that have been used to justify slavery, corporal punishment of children, domestic violence, etc. So, uh, um, yeah, it's an important question because, of course, we want uh, to uphold justice. So, um, what? How would you? Yeah, how would you? How would you approach that question, Jennifer? What would you say to our listener? Yeah, I mean, um, I I would approach those texts um, the same way I think we should approach most scriptures that we're reading. Like the two important things or questions that we could ask in terms of um, the text, and that's one is context, right? Um, what is yeah. going on in this text? When was this written? Who was this written to? Like those kind of questions I think are really important to provide some perspective um, around why this text might make meaning at the time it was written, but also why it might make me meaning for us. And then you can kind of ask those same questions for yourself in terms of what are you bringing to the text? How do you define justice? Because what looks like justice for one may not necessarily look like justice for someone else, right? And so, um, I think those are kind of important frameworks to have as we're approaching the text. Now, that is not to dismiss what we already know to be true about the biblical text itself. Are there moments in the text where we will see, witness, read about violence? Absolutely. Are there moments in the text well, where it, it, the Bible clearly states um, for slave uh, slaves to obey their masters? Yes. Right. Yes. We've read that. Right. But. I think what's equally as important is that we understand, um, is this part of the, the Pauline tradition? As in, did Paul write this Paul self? And does that matter to how we understand the interpretation of this text? That might be one question to answer or ask. Another one might be, well, if you read this alongside Aristotle's politics and we find hmm. the same exact kind of household codes, then how does that expand our context of understanding of what's going on in the ancient community? Hmm. So in Aristotle, Aristotle is arguing that if you have an orderly family, then you will have an orderly society. Hmm. hmm. So when I read this and in what the does biblical he mean context, by, yes. Sorry, what, what does Aristotle mean by an orderly household? Or orderly uh, orderly household is that the, the, the husband is in charge, oversees the wife and the child, that uh, it, literally it is a reflection of the household codes that we find in um, the New Testament texts uh, in, that we see uh, Colossians, Ephesians, right? In the, the most extreme form, uh, complete forms, I should say. But you also see it in First Peter um, in, in Titus and Timothy as well, where it's wives obey husbands, slaves obey masters, children obey parents. This kind of yeah. power dynamics within households really was about creating an orderly society. So how do we keep things functioning in a way in which things can progress? It is that we have order. And order means, in this particular case, the Hellenistic influence of the text is telling us this is one way, this is one model, right? Mm -hmm. For how we can have order. But we see another model in Galatians 3.28, right? Where there is, there, is, there is no distinction. There is not male or female, enslaved or free. We are all one in Christ is what Paul is writing in Galatians. And so that is why I think context is important um, for helping us to better understand what these texts might be saying at the time and also to us. And so for me, it says, oh, this writer wants us to think about creating order in society, 
right? How do, how do we do that? Um, and they're using the, the Aristotelian model to think about how we mm-hmm. do that in the, you know, in our Christian community, um, mm-hmm. right? Um, and, and so what we might read as a directive, as in slaves should obey, um, mm-hmm. is actually more of an exemplar of in this society, at this time, <laughs> this is how we saw order, you know, or this is a way in which we could establish order. And another thing it might be telling us is that the, the, the community itself is challenging um, some of those things that have been seen as the way that things have always functioned, right? This is the way it has functioned. And so I need to affirm that because it's being challenged in some way. All mm-hmm. that to say, uh, is that I don't know that we can read any of these texts as simply justifying um, a position without asking some of those questions um, behind the text as well, around the text. It's It strikes me as similar to some of the conversations that we've had on this podcast in the past. Again, you know, I think, I think as really important, like um, you're asking the question, Jennifer, what is the text trying to do? Right. And similarly to how, you know, um, there's this kind of like 19th century, 20, early 20th century, like American impulse to try to read the whole thing as like the same. Right. Like in a sort of fundamentalist way. Um, And actually different books in the Bible are doing different things and they're written by different people in different genres. Some are literature, some is poetry, some is history, but you know, some of it, some isn't right. Or isn't intended to be taken that way. And so similarly, we reread these other texts carefully and we ask ourselves, okay, culturally speaking, what's happening? Um, you know, what is the, what is perhaps a, uh, a culturally bound um, or culturally context specific kind of text versus something that is meant to be applied, you know, at all times and in all places universally. Yes. And I I think to the, you know, more immediate question of justice is that Mm -hmm. uh, if you're reading those verses that I just mentioned, what we call the household codes, um, it may, it may come across as these texts do not uphold justice. Again, context, (laughs) right? Context is in that context, from one perspective, it is very much about creating a just society as understood from a very particular perspective. And so that is why I think it's important, That why I think it's important to ask those questions. Um, it might not feel just to the child, to the enslaved, um, or, or to you know even the wives in this case, right? But if right? Yeah. to those who are setting the standard of creating the rules, it is, this is the intention. The intention is not to create an, uh, it is to create a just society in that perspective. Um, but when it comes to violence, I think it is, is a bit different than what we're talking about here, right? In, in terms that violence should never be condoned in the ancient world or in our contemporary context. And again, I think those questions become very important for what the text is trying to do, what it's trying to teach us, what the text itself is really saying, versus what we might be reading into the text Hmm. Mm -hmm. or what we might be bringing with us to the text. Um, I I say this to to my children often is that I bring my personal experience into their lives and they're not living the same um, in the same moment that I have lived in. Right. And so their upbringing is very different than mine geographically, what I've experienced, um, what they are experiencing. And I have to caution myself. Right. To not to Im- not to Im- impose on them um, the things that I went through. Um, and I think we do that in the text often. There's a, a quote I, I put on my uh, intro to New Testament syllabus sometimes. And uh, it, it says um, we do not read the Bible the way it is. We read the Bible the way we are. Mm-hmm. And so um, as we're as we're looking for justice in the in the text, um, I, it leads me to ask the reader, what what text are you talking about in particular? Is there some place where you're not seeing justice? How do you define justice? I think it's a great entry point into having a much larger conversation um, about how we approach the Bible in general. Uh, that's really helpful. I, I, 
so I teach Old Testament, and and I often tell my students that, particularly in the intro Old Testament class, that reading the Bible is a cross cultural experience, right? Mm-hmm. Like there are uh, situations and um, circumstances and context that are not true for us and were true for those, uh, you know, in in ancient Israel. And one example I'll just use quickly is there's a text in uh, the Pentateuch, I'm forgetting where exactly now, I think it's, uh, I think it's in Leviticus, uh, but it could be Deuteronomy, where if a, if a man rapes a woman, he has to marry her. And we read that now and we're, and he can't divorce her. And we read that now and we're like, oh my gosh, that's, that's terrible. Right. And, and it is terrible to think of that kind of violence than, uh, you know, having to live with the, the perpetrator for the rest of your life. And I'm not condoning that. Uh, and at the same time, y- you have to remember the context of the old, you know, ancient Israel where a woman doesn't own property. A woman doesn't, uh, isn't, a, it basically can't live as an independent person as a single person and is under the authority of her father. And then, or, or under the, uh, or uh, uh, her father provides for her and then her husband provides for her. And so this is, in that context, uh, protecting, at least in some sense, protecting the woman by saying, okay, you, you, you know, you violated this woman. Now you have to take care of her for the rest of your life and you can't divorce her. Now, again, I am not condoning that. I think, um, uh, that would much not better fly. to live in a society where we're all free, right? Yeah, that is exactly. the, that is much better, right? Yeah, but but knowing the context mm-hmm. helps. If even if you don't agree with that law, at least helps you understand the the intent of it, uh, perhaps more than just a just an initial reading of it. And and to know that that the, because that text appears in in our Bible isn't a justification of that action. It can be a reflection right. of what is happening in that society at that time. I mean, it's a reflection right. of what's happening in our society, the violent part of this, right, right? in our society sure. as well, right? And so, um, you know, the, the question of how this, the texts are being used to justify these behaviors is the second part of this, right? Is right. like these texts can be used in the same way that the Bible has been used to justify slavery. It was also used to uh, justify abolition, right? Like the same exact right. text. Mm-hmm. Um, and right. that is where interpretation comes into play is, you know, the same story of, of um, the, the first kind of family and, and how we uh, conceived of, of race um, based upon the, the first family in the scripture is the same text that was being used to say, yes, we're all connected. We're all family. We're all the same, Mm -hmm. (laughs) right? Ultimately, we are all connected. Um, And so the same exact text, I think, is important for us to see can be used to to justify these horrific uh, things that we as humans do, uh, but also can be used to bring about justice and liberation. Mm. Would you say just a bit more, Jennifer? You 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 said earlier something that I think is uh, is really profound and and deserves more discussion. You said you know so you read these household codes that talk about wives obeying their husbands and slaves obeying their masters, but we also have texts like Galatians three. Um, uh, I'm going to read twenty seven and twenty eight. Right, as many of you as were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is no longer Jew or Greek. There is no longer slave or free. There is no longer male and female. For all of you are one in Christ Jesus. Say, can you say a bit more about like how is that in conversation with the household codes, or how does that help our interpretation of them? Yeah, I mean, I think it it tells us a couple of things about the early Christian community and its diversity and the issues that these communities are dealing with. Right. Um, and which is why I said the, the actual even writing of the household codes in those letters could be a corrective to what was seen in Galatians. So you all understood Paul to be teaching this open and free society where everyone is equal. And, you know, those communities are saying, yeah, that's what we heard when Paul cool. came. This is what we <laughs> that's what he look. This you're reading the letter. Right. We're reading Galatians. That's what he said. It's written <laughs> slightly earlier than those other letters. And then the later letters. 
we're seeing a corrective perhaps for what's happening in the earlier letters. Um, and so that's what I would say that is, this is the importance of them being in conversation, but also understanding that they're distinct communities who may be wrestling with different issues and who may be pointing to like, oh, look over there is how they function. And here is chaos, right? It's, it, mm -hmm. I often look at First Corinthians as an example of um, how we can read what's actually happening in this community. The fact that women are being told to not speak or to quiet down, they're being told both, right? Tells us what? Fundamentally, it tells us that women were talking. It tells us women were prophesying or else you wouldn't have to tell them not to do that. And even more, it tells you the questions that the community asked of Paul. Paul, mm -hmm. is it okay that this is happening in our community? Is this what it means for us to be trying to live out right? These resurrected lives. What does that mean for us um, right. as we wait for Jesus to come back? How do we live, right? And that is part of what these texts give us. Um, and I think that's why, right, it's important that we um, understand them individually, individual letters, individual books, um, and also collectively <laughs> um, as the overarching um, message. We need the Gospels because otherwise Paul doesn't tell the full story. Right. So right. We, we do need right. that. Right. Right. So how do how do we decide which one it is? Right? Like, like like household codes versus, uh, you know, there is no longer slave or free, no longer Jew or Greek. I know that's the million dollar question, right? But, like, <laughs> you're begging but, the question, literally. Which is why yes. I'm asking you, Jennifer. Right, right, right. I mean, I, how I decide is, um, you know, the, the household codes are written much later. Than Galatians, right? So as you study the history of the text, uh, it, it comes first. Um, so that's something to think about. Not saying that that's necessarily the reason to privilege it, um, but it also seems to be proposing a different way of being um, mm. than the Hellenistic culture. And so there seems to be some sort of rub going on here. And so at the minimum, I could say there's contestation in the early Christian community about how we live in community, whether, you know, who experiences this type of freedom. Um, and we kind of repeatedly hear Paul in particular writing about how we are free in Christ, writing about this yeah. freedom in right. Christ, right? And so how do communities translate that freedom, right? Mm -hmm. and, and so it could be that this community is translating that freedom in a way that all are experienced this kind of egalitarian equality, um, and that there are those who are challenging it. So I would read it as an op, a, like a way of being in community that was an option in the early mm -hmm. church, right? Like it's not, it was, there were communities living this way. Um, and there were communities who clearly chose that there needed to be a different order. And then you see a very specific type of ordering that's given in, you know, th you see these letters starting to get into bishops and, um, and deacons and like really ordering the way in which we uh, worship together, not just being community together. So I would, one reflection that I would have too to that question, Catherine is like a couple things. One is um, I think interpretation is discerned in community together over a long time. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I think in our, in our, from our cultural perspective, we're very individualistic, right? We're very right now focused. That's just human, I think, to be right now focused. But it helps to sort of look back and say, you know, this book, it, you know, these books have been compiled over centuries, right? And have been read and interpreted and reinterpreted over millennia, um, which is not to say that every interpretation of them has been good or not, but there's this sort of sense of it working itself out, maybe, hopefully. Um, and also that we look at the fruits, right? We look at the fruits mm -hmm. of the interpretations as one way. And then the other thing I would say is we probably just have to be super humble about it and recognize that we're all standing from a particular vantage point in history and culturally speaking. And we should have enough humility, I think, to not assume that we are exactly right, 
right? There's going to be people, people well into the future are going to look back at us and be like, they were so messed up about this and that. And people from like, if people who lived, you know, a thousand years ago saw where we were now, they'd be like, oh my gosh, what is even happening? Right? So there's this, (laughs) we do, we do, we do our best, but like, we're saved by grace, right? Not by being right. (laughs) And so there's this kind of holding, holding uh, um, with some humility, the reality that we are products of our own time and place the same way that like these texts are. And like, you know, that helps me anyway, to, to not be, you know, to say, well, I, I would interpret this this way. That's where I'm coming from. You know, I'm not saying this has to be the end all be all interpretation for all time forever. And amen. But that's how I would look at it right now, coming from this particular location in, you know, history and culturally and blah, blah, blah. No, I, I think that's helpful. Thanks, Katie. Jennifer, I wonder, you you had mentioned earlier uh, that uh, justice, that you have to define justice and that justice may look different depending on one's circumstances. Can you Can you elaborate on that too, like, or give an example or? Um, I can try, <laughs> right? Yeah. Uh, and it, it was it was really thinking about what Katie said when she was like, um, kind of like, we all get to be free, right? It's 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 this, which is why I ask in in terms of the the question itself, what does it mean to uphold justice and for whom? Um, that l- justice looks very different for the enslaved community of the ancient world. I'm talking first century texts. Um, that that justice looks very different in the context of the Roman Empire than what justice would look like for the Roman centurion, um, oh, perhaps, yeah, yeah, yeah. perhaps. Mm-hmm. And so, as we're reading these texts, that's the type of complexity that I'm thinking we should be aware of um, when we we are asking about justice. And to Katie's point, in justice in the first century world, is that the same as justice in our world? Um, in our contemporary context of what we mean when we say um, we're we're one in the Bible to uphold justice. And in some cases, I think absolutely, absolutely. If we're talking about human freedom, if we're talking about love and liberation of people, um, yes, I think that those can be, but I think we need to all be on the same page when we're defining those things. And I really think the heart of the question is, is how does the text justify um, these kind of horrific, this violence, this, uh, these moments of violence in history. And, uh, you know, I, the text doesn't necessarily justify it again. Right. I yeah. think the text reflects right. Right, right. what's happening in the yeah. ancient world. And because of that, um, we have used the text to say, see, there was slavery back in this time. So sh- surely there should be slavery now, but the t- text doesn't tell us that, right. That it has yeah. to happen into perpetuity. It's just a reflection of what was happening in that society at the time. Um, and so in, in that way, we can't, you know, I think we have to ask those questions that I mentioned at the beginning to say, well, yeah, that was what was happening, but that doesn't mean that, that in our society today, that the text is justifying it. Um, mm. Those aren't the same. It's describing it, perhaps. Exactly. Right? It's descriptive. Exactly. It's descriptive. It's not prescriptive, right? It's Absolutely. it's describing what was, or what that context, historical context was. It's not saying that's what it should be forever and ever. Right. And and the reason I like to introduce Galatians three twenty eight and in, into the conversation when I see kind of. Uh, at least what what sounds to me like the household codes underlying the the question a bit there yeah. um, is is that there are alternative ways of thinking about community in the ancient mm. world, which hopefully gives mm-hmm. us in our contemporary world imaginative ways of thinking about community. How can we imagine a more free society? How can we imagine a more just society? Even if that's not what we're living in, how can we imagine something differently? And I think we see that when we see these variances in the text too. Yeah, that's really helpful. And I think it's important to note that just historically speaking, the church, the early church had a lot of kind of uh, people at the margins of society, right? Um, mm-hmm. uh, enslaved people, women, poor people, 
right? That that this message of freedom, this message of 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 oneness in Christ, of being, uh, you know, all of you are one in Christ Jesus. All of you have clothed yourselves with Christ. This is a a really radical message of of belonging and of of meaning, right? That that in a society where these folks were not. Uh, the powerful ones and we're not the valued ones, right? In in Christ, you are a son and daughter of God, right? That's a really radical and liberating message. Mm-hmm. And I would argue it is still today, right? For those yeah, of us who does. exist yes. on the margin, who you know aren't at the center of what is seen as wealth and power in this society, it's a liberating message to think that we are sons and daughters and children of God. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Well, that seems, that seems like a good place to end. Uh, thank you to our listener for that question. And thank you again so much, uh, Jennifer, for joining us, for being willing to join us again. And uh, we, we threw some hard questions at you this time around. Yeah, we so <laughs> we really appreciate, really you appreciate the your faithfulness. Yeah. We appreciate your faithfulness and your insight and your, and your, just your, uh, knowledge about about scripture. So thank you so much, uh, and thank you to those who uh, are listening or or watching this podcast. We ask you to to rate and review us uh, on YouTube and uh, on Apple, and uh, and you know uh, share the, share the podcast with a friend. If you uh, want to find out more, uh, please go to enterthebible.org where there are lots of uh, other podcasts and videos and blog posts and uh, information about scripture, uh, in-depth study of, of all the d- biblical books, uh, and uh, just just take advantage of that free resource uh, from us here at Luther Seminary. And uh, thank you for listening. Uh, please share it with a friend. Until next time.